In all the hustle and bustle of modern-day British life, particularly in the country's capital, London, the term D-Day has come to mean anything that is both imminent and of extreme importance. Ask the majority of younger people where the expression comes from and they'll no doubt tell you that it had something to do with World War II. But ask one of the servicemen or women or folk left behind in Britain to keep the home fires burning and they'll all tell you the same thing. D-Day, June the 6th, 1944, marked the beginning of the end of World War II, when the French beaches of Normandy were liberated from Nazi occupation by the Allied invasion force. To really appreciate and understand the full implications of D-Day, it does need to be set in context. When armistice came for the soldiers of World War I in 1918, it was hailed as the war to end all wars. But sadly, within just 20 years, the storm clouds of another major global conflict were gathering. Germany surrendered, the Treaty of Versailles demanded such huge reparation to be paid as a war debt, forcing the German nation to accept sole responsibility for the hostilities, the peace was always going to be an uneasy one. A young Austrian by the name of Adolf Hitler had made something of a reputation for himself fighting for the German army, winning the Iron Cross for Valour. But even at this early stage, there were rumours that a medical examination had found him to be psychotic. Hitler's views were horribly anti-Semitic, and he was not alone. With other like-minded ex-soldiers, he entered politics, offering the German nation, by then facing economic disaster, a scapegoat for all of their troubles, the Jews. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, better known as the Nazis, with Hitler in control, steadily rose to power as the standard of living for the German people collapsed with mass unemployment and starvation. Germany was banned from having any military capability after World War I. But Hitler flouted the Treaty of Versailles to build a huge army into which the unemployed were conscripted. With uniforms to wear and flags to wave, a sense of restored national pride saw Hitler democratically voted into power with his newly acquired German citizenship. The rest of the world looked on with growing concern as Hitler firstly seized his homeland Austria in 1938 before targeting Czechoslovakia. The British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, averted war in 1938 by appeasing Hitler, but it was only a postponement of what was sadly inevitable. By September 1939, the peace agreement had been completely violated by Hitler as he'd taken Czechoslovakia and compounded matters by marching into Poland. Great Britain and France had promised to protect Poland and when the deadline for the Germans to leave had expired at 11 a.m. on Sunday the 3rd of September 1939, Britain and her allies had to face the fact that this time they really were at war with Germany. The early part of the war definitely went Hitler's way as he occupied Denmark, Norway, Belgium, Holland and even France. Left alone across the English Channel, 
the British acquired a new Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, who incited a wartime spirit in the people of Britain that even Adolf Hitler couldn't destroy. At Dunkirk, the Allies were driven out of France by the advancing Germans, leaving precious vehicles and munitions behind them, lucky to escape with their lives. A remarkable response from the civilians of the south coast of England saw a huge flotilla of tiny craft, including yachts, fishing dinghies and even rowing boats, cross the channel to help bring back the defeated stranded soldiers. Miraculously, over a third of a million men were rescued to fight another day, and in the months and years ahead, they had a very important role to play. Through 1940 and 41, mainland Britain took a considerable bashing from Hitler, as with the Battle of Britain, and the Blitz bombs every night, he first tried to invade the island nation, and then, when that didn't work, crush it into submission by fear. With Winston Churchill running the country, neither ploy was successful. Although with mainland Europe occupied by the Nazis, life in Britain was far from comfortable. In December 1941, America entered the war alongside their British allies after the Japanese, who were part of an alliance with Germany known as the Axis Powers, bombed the US Navy base at Pearl Harbor. The world was at war against Adolf Hitler and the battle raged on a global scale. Fighting in the Atlantic, the Pacific, North Africa, Europe, and on the Russian front continued through 1943. But as the new year of 1944 was rung in by Big Ben, the tide that had seemed set fair in Hitler's favour definitely started to turn. Everyone knew that an Allied invasion into northern France was imminent especially the Germans. But exactly where and when it would come was a matter of conjecture. With the utmost precision, the south coast of England was transformed into a training camp and an enormous embarkation point. Allied troops from all over the world, including the Americans, Canadians, Australians and New Zealanders, joined the British for a combined operation led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, which was codenamed Overlord. Keeping the D-Day landings, as they became known, secret was a matter of the utmost importance, because the element of surprise would be crucial to the invading Allied armies. British counterintelligence really played its part, convincing the Germans that the attack, when it came, would be at the narrowest point across the channel, between Kent and Calais. In the build-up to D-Day, whenever a reconnaissance flight went over Normandy, two were sent over the Pas de Calais, and all German eyes were focused miles away from the beautiful beaches of Normandy that would all too soon be awash with blood. Then, just weeks before the invasion plans were about to be put into action, the British Secret Service spotted a worrying run of answers in the Daily Telegraph crossword that triggered a full-scale alert. Connected with the D-Day landings, there were a number of code words which were supposed to be top secret. As already mentioned, the whole operation was Overlord, but the various target landing beaches also had code names. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, 
and sold. Alarm bells started ringing, firstly, when the word Utah appeared, quickly followed by Omaha. It was certainly a strange coincidence. Then the word Overlord cropped up, and when Mulberry appeared, the code for the artificial harbours that the Allies were planning to build at two of the landing beaches, British intelligence became very concerned. To compound matters, on the 2nd of June, the word Neptune appeared, which was the code for the entire naval involvement in Operation Overlord. The compiler of the crosswords, an English teacher, was paid a visit by MI5, much to his surprise and horror, as he had no idea what the words meant. The whole incident was certainly bizarre, and no explanation found, although there have been plenty of conspiracy theories to surface since. When the date had been selected for D-Day, the state of the tide was very carefully considered, and the choice of the month of June would offer the best possible chance of reasonable weather, but the British are renowned for being preoccupied with the weather, and for very good reason. Quite unexpectedly, in the run-up to D-Day, the weather turned absolutely foul. Gale force winds and storms that would not have been out of place in the middle of winter lashed the south coast of England. It would, without doubt, make the invasion much harder for the Allies, but it improved the chances of a surprise attack. Field Marshal Erwin Rommel was the man charged with resisting the expected Allied invasion, and with his focus locked on Calais, he looked at the weather in the first few days of June and decided that there would be no invasion in such atrocious conditions. Rommel was so sure of this, he returned home to Germany for his wife's birthday party. Not only was he looking in the wrong place, he'd also underestimated the steely resolve of the Allied commanders an error of judgment that would lead to the ultimate demise of Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich. Getting word to the French resistance that the D-Day landings were imminent was a tricky business. But on the 1st and 5th of June, the BBC broadcast the long sobs of the violins of autumn and wound my heart with a monotonous languor, the agreed messages to herald the invasion. Evidently, this was not such a well-kept secret, as the chief of German intelligence had been given a tip-off to this effect. When the strange words were heard, the Germans dismissed it as preposterous that the British would send such an important communication over the BBC airwaves. The planned date for D-Day had been the 5th of June 1944, but the Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Expeditionary Force, General Dwight D. Eisenhower, was forced to postpone the operation by a day due to the appallingly unseasonable weather. Things didn't look a great deal better for the 6th of June either, and with thousands of troops already aboard ship, Eisenhower had a very difficult decision to make. If the invasion couldn't go ahead on the 6th, it would be at least another fortnight before the condition stood any chance of being right again for another attempt. Keeping the operation secret for that long, with the south coast of England in suspended animation, would be very difficult, if not completely impossible. Eisenhower showed resolutely why he had been made Commander-in-Chief when he took the decision to put Operation Overlord into action, despite the stormy seas that had to be crossed. The first skirmishes of D-Day, however, involved aircraft rather than shipping. The designated American landing beaches of Utah and Omaha were at the Cherbourg end of the Normandy coastline, and to make way for the landing craft, the American 82nd and 
and 101st Airborne Divisions flew on ahead to drop paratroopers to support the attack. Sadly, many of the American airmen were dropped miles off course, and because Rommel had flooded any ground suitable for parachutists to land on, a number of them were drowned. However, the most famous parachute landing of D-Day was in the little French town of St. Mary Glisse, where Private John Steele got caught on the church spire. For hours he dangled, pretending to be dead, but eventually the Germans captured him. At the other end of the landing beaches, close to Caen, the British 6th Airborne Division made a daring landing in wooden horse gliders, perfectly on target to take the strategically important Pegasus Bridge. For the French, who'd suffered the German occupation for so long, this was definitely something to celebrate. As the British troops secured Pegasus Bridge, the neighbouring cafe cracked open the champagne specially dug up from the garden, where it had been hidden from the Germans. The journey across the English Channel was rather more uncomfortable for those aboard ship than it had been for the airborne troops. To organise such a wide range of soldiers to attack a diverse geographical objective had taken a great deal of planning. But, as Winston Churchill so succinctly put it to President Roosevelt, the Normandy invasion was much the greatest thing that they had ever attempted, and how right he was. There was no convenient port for the Allied invasion force to target, although the Utah landing beach was added almost as an afterthought because of its close proximity to Sherbrooke. However, the necessity for the large artificial harbours, codenamed Mulberries, was still of vital importance. One would be constructed from Omaha Beach in the American sector, and the other from Gold Beach in the British sector. Also, the large troop-carrying ships could only get within a certain distance of the landing beaches. Therefore, it will be necessary for the soldiers, tanks and equipment to be put ashore on LCVPs, which stands for Landing Craft, Vehicle and Personnel. Consequently, after a very rough crossing, the troops had to face climbing down into Landing Craft on stormy seas to finish their journey into enemy territory. For those who'd managed to get across the channel this far without suffering nausea, the LCVPs would not allow them to keep the contents of their stomachs in place. Swamped by crashing waves and tossed around like corks, some of the men even had to use their helmets to help clear the water from the craft, with the most unlucky needing to endure a ten-mile run from mothership to shore. The state of those who survived the LCVPs was poor to say the least, as they were soaked, nauseous and very disorientated. It was no way to face an old friend, let alone a deadly enemy. However, if the Allied invasion were struggling with seasickness, their German counterparts were equally as unsettled by the sight of a vast armada of battleships unexpectedly coming towards them. When news of the airborne attacks had reached the German commanders, They'd delayed any action because Hitler was sleeping and didn't appreciate being wakened. On this occasion, no 
doubt, he would have preferred to have been disturbed. Still, the Germans were convinced that there was nothing to worry about because of the weather, although, as time ticked on and the invasion fleet came into view, there was no denying the fact that they'd been taken by surprise. Vital hours had been lost, and it was one of the few pieces of good fortune that the cold, wet, seasick Allied servicemen could take heart from. Despite the fact that D-Day veterans are decreasing in number with every passing year, there are a great many people who come to Normandy to visit the landing beaches and the cemeteries between Cherbourg and Caen. Some are relatives of those who took part in this military operation, while others simply want to understand what happened here. Whatever the reasons, this is an amazing trail to follow, and for the purposes of this programme, We'll start in the west at Utah Beach and head eastwards along the coast to Sword Beach. As dawn broke over Utah Beach, 30,000 American troops and 3,500 vehicles were ready and waiting to come ashore. After so much anticipation, and a terrible sea crossing, the invasion force was in for a surprise, but this time it was a pleasant one. An error in navigation had brought them onto the beach almost a mile south of their target, and the sector of beach in which they landed was virtually undefended. The beach was flat, the sand dunes low, and enemy gunfire was sporadic. A single German battalion was taken completely by surprise, and as a result, Allied casualties, 197 men and 32 tanks, were far lower than anybody had dared hope for. Not to be confused with President Franklin D. Roosevelt, the son of the former President Theodore Roosevelt, was actually in command at Utah. When he was informed of the navigational error, he was philosophical, saying, we'll start the war from here. For the Americans who arrived on Utah Beach that auspicious morning, it was indeed a very good place to start. Moving on down the Normandy coastline, en route to the next landing beach at Omaha, the 100-metre cliff face at Point de Hoc is a striking as D-Day dawned, Allied intelligence believed that there was a huge German gun battery at the summit of the cliff that could target Utah and Omaha beaches. An American Ranger battalion was sent in to destroy the battery, but it was a daring and dangerous enterprise. 225 Rangers landed, but only 90 survived to tell the tale. The Germans had a terrific vantage point and defended their stronghold to the last man. When eventually the Rangers reached the top of the cliff, they realised they'd been fighting for control of an empty crater. The big guns had all been moved further inland making the 60% casualty rate for the mission a high price to pay. Yet, for the Americans, the worst carnage still awaited them, despite the fact that all seemed quiet as the landing craft approached Omaha Beach. Allied intelligence was again found lacking, as it was believed that there would be little German resistance to the advance, with troops made up with conscripted Russian and Polish prisoners of war. There was an elite German infantry division in Normandy, the 352nd. The Allies were convinced that they were at least 20 miles from Omaha. They could not have been more wrong in their assessment of what the American soldiers would face, because the 352nd German infantry division was ready and waiting on the clifftop above the beach. Of all the landing beaches, 
The terrain at Omaha was the most difficult to cross, with steep bluffs and cliffs, which perfectly concealed the defending German army. With the tactical skills that would be expected of well-trained, experienced infantrymen, the Germans held their fire as the soaking wet, seasick allies put down the ramps of the landing craft, making ready to scramble ashore. It was only then that the German guns started to attack the stranded Americans that were quite literally sitting ducks. This account, recorded by the US War Department's Historical Division, gives a harrowing description of what happened on Omaha Beach on that stormy June morning. Within 10 minutes of the ramps being lowered, a Company had become inert, leaderless and almost incapable of action. Every officer and sergeant had been killed or wounded. It had become a struggle for survival and rescue. The men in the water pushed wounded men ashore ahead of them, and those who reached the sands crawled back into the water, pulling others to land to save them from drowning, in many cases only to see the rescued men wounded again or to be hit themselves. Within 20 minutes of striking the beach, A Company had ceased to be an assault company and had become a forlorn little rescue party bent upon survival and the saving of lives. Omaha was very important because it linked the US and British invasion beaches, but the cost of the landing was very high. The casualty rate was in excess of 5,000 dead, missing or wounded men, yet somehow the survivors forged their way inland to complete with honour the task they'd been entrusted with. As the Americans were facing the full horror of German supremacy on Omaha, the 50th Division of the British 2nd Army came face to face on Gold Beach with the inferior enemy troops that had been expected at Omaha. However, resistance to the Allies was fierce for a brief time, due in part to the fact that the arrival of the Sherman tanks needed for the advance had been delayed. Unlike the Americans, the British deployed heavy armoured vehicles to clear obstacles and mines, the funnies and flail tanks being prime examples that were very effective indeed. The primary task of the soldiers on Gold Beach was to seize the seaside town of Aramanche and push on inland towards Bayeux while making contact with the Americans from Omaha and the Canadians on their eastern side at Juneau. By the end of D-Day, the 50th Division, after a shaky start and heavy casualties in the opening moments, rallied extremely well and were at the outskirts of Bayeux by nightfall. The individual heroism and bravery displayed by the men to achieve this was above and beyond the call of duty. This citation for CSM Stanley Hollis of the 6th Battalion, the Green Howards, who was awarded the Victoria Cross for his actions on Gold Beach, eloquently sums up the mood of the day. Wherever fighting was heaviest, CSM Hollis appeared and in the course of a magnificent day's work, he displayed the utmost gallantry, and on two separate occasions, his courage and initiative prevented the enemy from holding up the advance at critical stages. It was largely through his heroism and resource that the company's objectives were gained and casualties were not heavier, and by his own bravery, he saved the lives of many of his men. When it comes to archive footage of the D-Day landings, some of the most widely seen pictures were taken at Juno Beach, where the Canadian forces came ashore. Like their American counterparts at Omaha, the Canadians faced a daunting task. 
because, although there were no elite troops in the vicinity, the firepower was considerable. In the first onslaught, the casualties were heavy, figures reaching up to 50%. But as the day wore on, the Canadians made incredible progress. The 6th Canadian Armoured Regiment were, in fact, the only Allied forces to meet their D-Day objective, crossing the Khan to Bayou Highway by the time darkness fell. There was little doubt for the Germans that the invasion had come, and once the initial shock subsided, the Nazi troops were quickly mobilised. The first counterattack of D-Day came from the 21st German Panzer Division, inland between Juneau and to the next beach, Sword, and over the coming days they proved to be a considerable threat. Yet the Canadians held out against whatever the Germans threw at them as they advanced through the French countryside. The distance between Juneau and Sword was relatively short, but conditions were nevertheless very different. The landing area on Sword was very concentrated, and with a swift incoming tide, there was considerable overcrowding. In the bottleneck of men and machinery, the German artillery were able to do significant damage. For the soldiers disembarking from the landing craft, there was nowhere to go but straight into the fray. If ever a morale boost was needed, it was on Sword Beach that June morning. It came in the form of a Scottish piper who launched himself waist deep into the bloody waters, fully kilted, as he bagpiped the men ashore to the strains of Highland Ladder. Once on the beach, and an obvious target for the Germans, the Piper marched up and down sword, playing on until all of his comrades were off the landing craft. One of the main objectives of the soldiers who landed on sword was to join up with the paratroopers who'd liberated Pegasus Bridge, and it's said that the same Piper played his rousing tunes all the way there. We can only hope that there was still some hidden champagne left at the cafe at Pegasus Bridge when he arrived. For the Allied commanders, D-Day, despite the terrible weather conditions, had proved an overall success. Eisenhower's brave decision to give the go-ahead had been vindicated, and Winston Churchill had probably never been more pleased to be proved wrong when the casualty figure came in at half what he'd predicted. Eisenhower didn't have an easy relationship with either Prime Minister Churchill or the British commander for Operation Overlord, Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery. Monty was fully occupied with the troops coming off the beaches in the British sector, targeting Con. But Churchill had wanted to actually sail with the D-Day invasion fleet. As Commander-in-Chief, Eisenhower had the unenviable task of telling Churchill that he couldn't go, because losing Churchill would have given the Germans a great prize, and Eisenhower was not prepared to take the risk, particularly as Winston was approaching his 70th birthday. Stubborn to the core, Churchill refused to be put off, and it took all the authority and diplomatic skill of King George VI rather than Eisenhower to stop him. However, what was definitely required at this crucial time was strong leaders who were not afraid to stand up for what they believed in. Understandably, there were going to be tensions between the various Allied commanders, 
After all, they would not be the right men to be doing the job if they were easily swayed. Despite the personality clashes, of which there were plenty, everybody shared the same objective. The world needed to be set free from the tyranny of Adolf Hitler and the Axis powers, and the early indications from D-Day suggested that the victory was now within the Allies' grasp. As the D-Day invasion developed into the Battle for Normandy, the Allies systematically set about achieving their objectives. With the beachhead established, the two artificial Mulberry harbours were towed across the English Channel and constructed at Aramanche on Gold Beach and at Omaha to provide the Allies with ports until Cherbourg could be liberated. The remains of the Mulberry at Aramanche, affectionately nicknamed Port Winston, in honour of Britain's much-loved Prime Minister, can still be seen to this day. But the one at Omaha did not fare so well. But it wasn't the German army responsible for its destruction. Thirteen days after D-Day, the weather dealt the Allies another blow when gale force winds smashed the Omaha Mulberry to smithereens. Montgomery had optimistically set the British soldiers who landed on Sword Beach the task of reaching Caen by the end of D-Day, but it proved to be too tall an order. Consequently, it became a major objective to take Caen, and Montgomery consistently attacked between D-Day and July the 1st. Caen fell to the Allies on the 7th of July, just over a month later than expected, and the push towards the liberation of France was back on track. To the west, the soldiers that had fought their way off the beaches at Utah and Omaha had a relentless task, making their way through the French countryside, which was littered with ancient banks and incredibly thick hedgerows. Impervious even to tanks, the landscape stalled the progress of the American infantry, and as it also provided perfect cover from which the Germans could attack, there were further casualties. Cherbourg was eventually surrendered to the Allies on the 26th of June 1944. It was yet another unpleasant surprise for Adolf Hitler, as he'd been convinced that his garrison in Cherbourg would hold firm against all comers. Hitler had again miscalculated, and with Cherbourg under Allied control, the days of the Nazi occupation in France were well and true. The breakout from the Normandy beaches to liberate the French interior was at times slow and very hard fought. By the middle of August, the bulk of the German resistance in the region had been eliminated. The beautiful city of Paris that had been subjected to Nazi rule for four long years was now in the Allies' sights and the people of France waited anxiously for its liberation. The situation in France was far from straightforward because, as Hitler asked, is Paris burning? Eisenhower planned to bypass the city. But the leader of the Free French, Charles de Gaulle, could not accept this and threatened to withdraw from the Allied cause altogether and dash for Paris himself, which was enough to make Eisenhower listen to what he had to say. De Gaulle knew the state of his capital city and convinced the Allied commander that Paris could be taken with ease. On the 25th of August, the fight for Paris was over and de Gaulle addressed the world. Paris outraged, Paris broken, Paris martyred, but Paris liberated. <laughs>
The liberation of Paris was a great achievement, and for the French resistance, who'd fought so hard to undermine the German occupation, it was the very least the Allies could do. The secret nature of the work of the resistance means that there are countless unsung heroes who played their part in the D-Day landings, sabotaging German operations throughout France. Fighting as proudly as the soldiers, sailors and airmen who gave their lives to secure the Normandy beaches, we'll never know exactly how many members of the French resistance made their ultimate sacrifice to make the defeat of Adolf Hitler possible. While Operation Overlord and the subsequent Allied advance towards Germany and Berlin gave Adolf Hitler problems from the West, the Eastern Front and the Russians were also making life very difficult for the German army. Warsaw, the capital of Poland, which had been so fundamental in bringing Britain and France into the conflict with Hitler back in 1939, was wrestled from German control as 350,000 Nazi soldiers were killed, wounded or captured. The Soviet army marched ever westward as the Allies battled their way towards Berlin. Yet for the people of Britain, and Londoners in particular, who'd suffered and survived the Blitz, the German bombers continued to wreak havoc with V1 and V2 rockets. A retaliatory Allied bombing raid on Dresden caused equal devastation and took many innocent German lives. Sadly, there were still casualties on both sides as the end of the war came into sight a very bitter irony after more than five long years of world war. On the 21st of April 1945, the Russians reached the German capital, Berlin, quickly followed by the Allies from the West. For Adolf Hitler, the war was lost, and after causing so much anguish, pain and suffering, rather than face the consequences of his actions, he committed suicide. The Nazi hierarchy fell like a house of cards and Germany surrendered unconditionally on the 7th of May. The victory in Europe was won and the celebrations began the very next day, known to the world as VE Day. London, the people filled the streets and the royal family, joined by Prime Minister Winston Churchill, came onto the balcony at Buckingham Palace to greet the grateful nation. Throughout the country, in towns and villages, people joined together for street parties as children who hadn't even been born when the conflict started celebrated along with the elderly folk who never expected to live long enough to see peace in their time. However, there was one very distinguished elder statesman who didn't get to see VE Day even though he'd been instrumental in bringing it about. President Franklin D. Roosevelt had been ailing for some time, and he died in April 1945, leaving new president Harry S. Truman to conclude the war in the Pacific. Unfortunately, the Japanese were determined to fight on, and were in no mood to talk peace despite the end of the war in Europe. Consequently, Truman was faced with an appalling dilemma. He could either mount a full-scale invasion of Japan, which would result in massive Allied casualties, 
or he could use the atomic bomb, which would decisively finish the war, but devastate thousands of innocent Japanese lives. Truman opted for the latter of the two evils, and on the 6th of August 1945, the first atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Later, a second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, and on the 14th of August, the Japanese surrendered. The Americans celebrated VJ, Victory Over Japan Day, and the world could rest a little easier, as the biggest conflict in history was officially over. in World War II, the events of D-Day, the 6th of June 1944, were some of the most significant in the eventual outcome of the war. As this programme draws to a close, we'll review the key points of the Normandy invasion that could have so easily turned the fates against the Allies rather than in their favour. and counterintelligence was critical, and although the Allies had the edge, it was a very close-run thing. Convincing the Germans that the attack was coming from Dover into the Pas de Calais was vital, and the efforts made to achieve this were meticulous. Even the Hollywood film industry played its part, as technicians were drafted in to create dummy army camps in the Dover area. Also, as the troops got ready for embarkation, the southwest coast of England was virtually shut off and only military traffic was allowed. Nobody else was permitted to move. Civilians were evacuated from the area and to this day there are a number of villages that were never restored. A very unfortunate incident remained top secret throughout the conflict happened at Slapton Sands along England's south coast. American troops were practicing for the Normandy landings when they were spotted by a German U-boat. Many American servicemen lost their lives in the ensuing attack and the Germans were convinced that they'd wiped out a major part of the Allied invasion force. This all helped when it came to D-Day, keeping the element of surprise on the side of the invading Allied army. When you mention D-Day and the assault on German-occupied Normandy, the first thoughts that spring to mind are of the landing craft and the naval bombardment of the beaches. Yet the contribution of the RAF to Operation Overlord was crucial. Here you see a lovingly restored classic Spitfire. Just watching this beautiful plane in flight, it's easy to understand why it was such a favourite with both pilots and the British public. One of the best places to experience the aircraft of World War II is an aviation heritage centre, such as this wonderful museum at East Kirby in Lincolnshire. And there's another treat in store. Although sadly, this grand Lancaster bomber doesn't fly anymore, she does at least make very welcome public appearances to taxi the runway. Just Jane has been painstakingly restored by Fred and Harold Panton, much to the delight of locals and visitors alike.
The roar of Just Jane's Merlin engines will bring memories flooding back for those that entrusted their lives to these aircraft back in World War II, whilst giving younger guests a real taste of the past. Both the Spitfires and the Lancaster bombers played a dramatic role in D-Day. It was imperative that not one German aircraft flew over the invasion fleet that stormy night and into the early hours of June the 6th. Nimble and fast in the air, the Spitfires intercepted any Luftwaffe in the area and, remarkably, the battleships and landing craft crossed the channel undetected. Meanwhile, the Lancaster bombers had the daunting task of destroying the German gun emplacements, both along the coast and inland. Watching just Jane going through her paces here on this quiet Lincolnshire airfield, a quick detour to France and the Lange battery on the outskirts of Bayeux will show precisely what the Lancaster bombers had to face. But the pilots and the aircrew rose to the challenge, and the airmen, the often unsung heroes of D-Day, served king and country above and beyond the call of duty, as they did throughout the entire war. Looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, it truly is miraculous that the D-Day invasion was a success for the Allies. So much could have gone wrong, and with the weather conditions being so terrible, it could be argued that much did. The complex relationships between the Allied commanders and key personnel were far from easy. Eisenhower, as an American, had the unenviable task of controlling both Winston Churchill and Field Marshal Montgomery, whilst bringing out their best qualities. However, it literally was a do-or-die situation, and as you would expect of such truly great statesmen, all differences were put aside and everybody focused on the task ahead, namely ridding the world of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi threat. When the Americans landed off course on Utah Beach, they adapted to the circumstances. At Point de Hoc, the Rangers faced a sheer cliff face, but fought onwards and upwards. The brave young men on Omaha came under horrendous enemy fire, but despite terrible losses, fulfilled the task they'd been allocated. The British glider pilots found their targets in pitch darkness. And the Canadian soldiers on Juno Beach refused to be halted or even slowed down by a bombardment of enemy fire. Against all the odds, those who dared won, and it's an achievement that the free world will never forget. Throughout this program, we've been watching archive footage shot on D-Day. The men who have fallen before your eyes never returned from France, giving their lives as the ultimate sacrifice. For the many people who make the pilgrimage to the Normandy beaches, the cemeteries along the coast are the most poignant memorials to the D-Day landings. The German cemetery at Le Combe is darkly moving, and when you see how many of the conscripted soldiers were boys of just 15 or 16, you realise what an international tragedy this really was. By stark contrast, the final images you'll see today come from the American cemetery high on the cliffs above Omaha Beach. As the flags flutter in the gentle French breeze and the white headstones stand proudly to attention, the legacy of D-Day lives on for all to see. When years earlier Winston Churchill uttered the immortal words, 
we shall fight them on the beaches. He could never have known quite what a challenge this would prove to be on D-Day. But his resolute cry of, we shall never surrender, summed up the battle strategy. The successful conclusion of Operation Overlord did mark the beginning of the end of World War II, and the Normandy invasion built slowly but surely upon the advances made on D-Day. For as long as the story of D-Day and the brave souls who gave their all to save the world from tyranny continues to be told, their sacrifice will not have been in vain. Even in the 21st century, this shining example of courage in the face of adversity is a lesson to each and every one of us. The last post will sound, but the memory of D-Day and all it represents will never dim. Rest in peace, comrades in arms. Rest in peace.